In the machining community, the quest for quality is represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The toolmakers who investigate ways to make things flatter and the machinists and artisans who depend on flatosity. These are their stories. In 2016, Kinetic Precision developed PFG stones, a way to help machinists and toolmakers get flat and stay flat. Shortly after that, Tom Lipton of Ox Tools taught us how to use the Whitworth three-plate method to inexpensively generate flat lapping plates to great precision. In April of 2022, Robin Renzetti came on the PFG Live and explained to us why two lapping plates are used all the time. The top one becomes concave and the bottom one becomes convex, allowing you to control your process. And more recently... Adam Balog of Laney Machine Tech was inspired to learn how to lap telescope mirrors, curved surfaces requiring great precision. He proceeded to share his experiences with us, which apparently took their toll. Adam is in recovery. So originally I was going to do the three plate method and I ended up getting these plates from McMaster Carr uh, turning them on the lathe to clean them up and then grinding them. And the result was I didn't need the three plate method. They were flat enough. And this is the story about getting from raw materials to a really great lapping plate. So I got the third lap on the table getting ground and it's doing its thing. Uh, these are the laps that I had ground before and I left them on the table uh, as I did the, the live. And you'll see that we got some staining here from the coolant and some of the schmutz sitting there. But other than the staining, um, you know, we, we applied the PFG stones here. And if you look at the information from the PFG stones, it's pretty, it's pretty darn good. Um, I don't see anything evil. I see a little bit of, well, there's tiny, tiny, tiny bit of patterning, but just almost nothing. So very happy with that grind. Uh, not happy with the staining, but this is the bottom of the laps. So I'm not going to go crazy. Meanwhile, uh, this guy is going and should be done pretty soon. We'll fill you in later. Well, they're not flat enough to ring. But, they are flat enough to pull a vacuum. <laughs> Not bad. Here you can see that great surface finish that we got on the grinder. And uh, it measured, I think that was the worst of the readings, 8.7 RA. Uh, and the finish was just spectacular. Here we're getting ready to make the D-cutter, which is going to cut a 60 degree V in our grooves on the laps. We're using a side plate supporting the Suburban Tool Master Grind, holding the bit, and it's being driven by a Suburban Tool motor. That's a uh, resin bond diamond wheel. I think it's a 150 grit. Uh, might be a 100 grit. Yeah, I think it's a 100 grit. And that's what we used to uh, make our tool out of solid carbide. That is a broken end mill, which we turned into a useful tool. I thought that was a pretty good trade-off. So this is the aftermath of making that D bit today. And I got a lot of cleaning up to do, but it was fun and successful. What do you do when you get this message? I'll tell you what you do. You call Robin because Robin had a really good idea.
Well, this should look like what we were talking about. I think it's going to work. And here's your, uh, the held back grooves. What do you think? Robin's idea was to terminate the grooves in the plate in one outer groove, like a trough, that would prevent the lapping slurry from rolling off the sides of the plate, which I thought was a fantastic idea. And we ended up doing that, and it worked great. This is the setup in the mill, and you can see we're using the Versa Grips by Mighty Bite to hold the discs, and uh, that worked out really nicely. Also, a shout out to Pearson Work Holding. You could see their pallet system on the left. There's our D bit all mounted up and ready to go to work, and work it did. And is that not a thing of beauty? Here you can see the grooves that we cut on the lathe to indicate that this is plate number two. So they can't be washed off or rubbed off uh, for plate identification. And you can see the, uh, the groove that Robin Renzetti suggested, which uh, it goes around the periphery. Everything worked just like it was supposed to. Well, the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the stoning. Let's have us a listen. Oh yeah, that came out stunningly well. Well, two more to go. Here's a couple of shots of the uh, plates up close and they worked as well as they looked. And uh, here you can see the uh, calibration check on our optical flats against each other and there are a couple of plates that we're going to be trying to look at but the only thing we were able to actually see was the back of the plates and you could faintly see uh, the fringes looked great oh glad you could make it hey listen let's talk about optical flats because I think we're using optical flats, but we're not explaining what they do. Let's say we wanted to measure this surface with an optical flat. We need a couple of things. The first thing we need is the surface. The second thing we need is, that's it, an optical flat. The third thing we need is a light source, and that light source has to be monochromatic. That means one color. That way, the waves coming off of that light source are all the same wavelength. That's important. Now, the thing is, is when we put an optical flat down on a surface, it actually doesn't go down on the surface because as soon as the optical flat gets close to being down on the surface, there's a cushion of air that does not want to get squeezed out. And it's eventually going to sit just like that, where there's contact on one side, but it's sitting on a cushion of air on the other side. So there's this wedge, this wedge of air in between the work and the bottom of the optical flat. So what happens is light comes through the optical flat, and when it hits the far side of the optical flat, some of it reflects back from that surface. Then it goes through and hits the work surface, and some of that reflects back. So if the distance between the bottom of the optical flat and the surface of the work is a quarter wavelength, then what happens is the, wa the wave of light hits the surface and comes back and they are exactly one half wavelength out of phase and they cancel. That's a dark band. If the space is an even multiple of a quarter wavelength of light, then they reinforce and you get a bright band of light. It looks like this. So if we're in contact here, and we're wedged up on this side, and you get this pattern coming out of your optical flat, 
this indicates perfect flatness because these lines are straight and parallel. Now, the spacing between the lines means absolutely nothing. It just tells you what angle that your wedge is at. Now, if you have any dirt underneath your optical flat, it's going to make the lines come out very closely spaced and a little harder to interpret. If it's nice and clean, then the optical flat is going to be on a cushion of air and you can actually manipulate it. And in the video, you'll see me possibly poking at the optical flat in order to make the lines spread out a little bit uh, and make them a little more visible. So if this is an indication of flat. Any curvature of the lines indicates concavity or convexity, uh, depending on where the contact point is. If the curves are toward the contact point, then it, that indicates a convex situation. And if the curves are away from the contact point, that would indicate a concave situation. So convex would be like that. Concave would be like that, assuming the contact point is over here. You can't tell where the contact point is unless you kind of poke it. And if you poke it here and nothing happens, then the contact point is probably here. If you contact tap it here and the contact and the, and the line spacing changes, in fact, it'll get wider, then you know the contact point is on the other side. Okay, so that is how optical flats work. Here you can see the interference fringes on a ground disc. This is a one inch A2 hardened steel disc that we'll be using for the remainder of the tests. And even off the grinder, it looks pretty darn good. Here are the five discs that we use in all of our tests. These are my discs from my five disc set for checking my chuck. Before I wanted to use my round laps, I had these square laps and I was trying to use uh, five micron aluminum oxide in WD-40 and I was getting limited success. But as you can see in these fringe patterns, I was getting convex results, which was uh, just not working out very well. It was an excellent experience, but it, it was not giving me good quality. This was a typical uh, bunch of beginner's mistakes. I was not lapping enough. Uh, I was getting these really rough uh, interference fringes. Um, and this was the best I got, but it wasn't good enough. Finally, I decided I had to start using the, uh, the round laps with diamond. And I bought some brand new diamond from McMaster Carr. So I cracked open a brand new three micron uh, diamond slurry and that combined with the round laps started doing magic. Here we're just checking our optical flats to make sure everything is uh, good. And you can see the lines are nice and straight. There's a little camera distortion. And here we manipulated the upper flat so that we can get wider bands and you can see they look good. So this is the best we were getting with aluminum oxide and why we switched. This is an indication of a convex surface and we really just weren't getting flat. So this is when I decided we had to switch over to diamond and uh, that's what we did. Unfortunately, it was the eight micron diamond, which I have some suspicions about, but it, it still started straightening out the lines and we started getting good results. Um, but as you can see, it's not soul satisfying and we were looking for better. This is when we made the switch to the three micron diamond slurry, brand new and the round laps and things started working magnificently. Here you can see that the slightly darkened material is in the grooves and on top of the surface and look at that. Perfect. First shots out of the barrel with the brand new slurry and brand new laps.
So here we are uh, finally <laughs> using my, my lapping discs. If you've been following along, you'll know that I made these discs uh, out of cast iron uh, discs from McMaster Carr. I then uh, put them on the lathe and uh, cleaned them up. Uh, actually, they have grooves in them. So this guy has, uh, has a single groove. This guy has a double groove, and in my drawer over there, I have one with a uh, three grooves. So plate one, plate two, plate three. Then I, I ground these on the surface grinder. I ground these on the Okamoto just to get them nice and flat, and of course, they're ridiculous. Um, and when I evaluated these, I figured out that uh, uh, they were flat. <laughs> so I didn't need to do the three-plate uh, auto generation uh, method for getting a flat surface. So after messing around with um, uh, with some square plates that I've had for a while and a couple of different formulations of slurry, um, I had a conversation with Robin and he said, uh, ditch, ditch the square flats, uh, uh, the square plates. So that convinced me to get going. So I took, um, I, I had purchased a uh, a potpourri, a variable uh, potpourri of, of uh, slurries. These are all from uh, Hyprex. Uh, this is the first one I bought. This is an eight micron. And then in this last batch, I bought three, one, and 0.25. And uh, I decided that we're gonna start with three. So I, I took a disposable uh, dropper. I have a bunch of these. I labeled it. So this is the three micron dropper and uh, put some of the slurry on here. Not a ton. Now you'll notice this design of the lapping plate. Uh, it has this outer groove and it does not go clear to the, the, the uh, grid pattern stops in the outer groove. This was another telephone conversation idea that I, uh, I got from Robin Renzetti. And it works great because it keeps your your slurry on the plate. So we have a we have the top plate and we have the bottom plate, and the top plate is the conditioning plate, okay? And it's used to condition the bottom plate. And well, what happens if you've been following along on our PFG lives, uh, the top plate will become concave and the bottom plate will become convex that's the natural uh the natural way of uh, of things we're not doing anything super fancy and this is how microscope i'm sorry telescope mirrors are made so we want to work on the bottom plate and then measure and if we have to we can go back to the opposite curvature and correct so that's a feedback loop uh to get to get to, to flatness. And there's reasons for that, but we won't, we won't dwell on that here. So we've got our uh, disc number one, and the way it works, it's pretty simple. We put our slurry on, and then we just, we just start working this disc on this plate. It's a little, little hard with one hand here, but notice I'm favoring the outer periphery. I'll come in, but I'll go back out. And it doesn't take very long, especially with diamond, to get some results. Okay? And that's basically the process. Now, I'm working with 3 micron uh, diamond. I can later go to uh, finer diamonds. But right now, um, I just want to see what kind of results I get. So I'm going to clean this up and head upstairs. And we'll take a look at what we're getting. Um... But this process is working great, and these uh, lapping plates are also working great. In fact, I'm going to order more blanks this week and make some more of these guys. We're in the lab at the bench, and I've got the, uh, the Lapmaster uh, helium lamp uh, fired up. Now, the light has a wavelength of 587.6 nanometers. Remember that. And uh, we're going to take a look at the flatness of this uh, one-inch A2 um, disc, which I've been working on. It's been cleaned with uh, isopropyl alcohol, and we're going to put the um, 
optical flat on it. So here's an optical flat, which I've had uh, for a while. Uh, this is a surplus uh, surplus unit. And uh, forgive me if I don't do a whole bunch of cleaning and stuff, but you can see almost immediately we get some nice results. Let me zoom in on that. And there it is, man. Let me tell you, that's flat. That's wicked flat. So I couldn't be happier. Um, and there you go. Uh, the summary here is we're using good lapping plates. We're using the Hyprex uh, formulation of Diamond Slurry, which was designed to do what it's doing. Uh, this is three micron lapping. So if you look at the if you look at the um, the part. It's not a mirror per se, but it's nice and reflective. And it's, uh, see, there's the, there's the iPhone there. Uh, there you go. And this, uh, for reference, this is disc number one of my hardened uh, A2 disc, which, by the way, was, is a five-disc set, which I use for doing five-disc uh, flatness measurements on the chuck. Isn't that cool? So uh, here are my two... Uh, samples my a2 hardened tool steel samples sitting underneath two optical flats and the one on the right this is number one this is the one you've seen pictures of and photos before the one on the left is number two i just lapped that one i don't think i spent five minutes lapping and if i start giggling uncontrollably you'll understand why when you see this That is just, I, words cannot express how good those are. <laughs> I'm very happy. Okay, here are my two, uh, my two discs. This is the one I've been working on. This is one I just lapped uh, downstairs, but these are both A2 hardened. And uh, it's no secret that my goal is to get these things to ring. Um, so this is the other side. This is the ground side, right? Uh, and the ground side is very good, but it's not ringing. So here's our three micron lap surface. <laughs> now, I don't think this is real true ringing, but they're getting ridiculously flat. So stay, stay tuned. We'll get to the point where we can get these guys to ring. All right, just to review our results here, this is a um, unlapped part. So this is surface ground only. You can kind of see the, the pattern, and you can see it has a curve in it, like a smile, indicating that it is not flat and if we mess around with the optical flat okay we can tell that that's the contact point and it's smiling toward the contact point so it's convex okay so that's as ground okay also you could uh, note that it's very hard to see the the lines all right <clears throat> here's number Number two, we've seen this one before. I'm going to hope that I don't get any schmutz in there. Boom. So now you notice a couple of things. You notice that the, um, you notice that the line contrast is excellent. Those lines are very straight. Okay, let's go to the next one. Here's number number one, which we've seen a lot of. Okay, and there's, boom, there's your lines. Very nice. Now let's go to the next one. This is number three. So number three looks a little chunky because we haven't, cleaned it much but there's number three so the point here is is that we've got a process that is 
simple and repeatable, and it involves just a high quality lap, uh, high quality uh, lapping materials, and uh, Bob's your uncle. So once again, here's the surface of, come on, focus. There we go. There's the surface of the ground unit, okay? Now, if we pick up one of the lapped units, you see that straight line? That's the edge of the light source. Very reflective. So this is three micron. Um, we're gonna graduate to smaller than three micron. But so far, it doesn't take very long. Literally, um, under five minutes to lap once once everything is set up so there you go